Good morning, Hildor. How are you today? Góðan daginn. Ég hef það bara fínt. Takkaði fyrir. Ah, okay. Well, I'm not sure I got all of that in English, but uh, I, I know we have a great show and you're going to tell us a little bit more about it. I'm Keith Fiveson with the Center for Wellbeing at the Work Mindfulness Project. And I am so excited today, Hildor, that uh, we have this show lined up because it really means not only so much uh, in terms of your connections, which I want to hear about, but also the planet. Uh, so who do we have speaking with us today? Well, today I have the privilege and, and uh, really the honor to bring uh, uh, a long-term friend, uh, Andre Snyder Magnusson. I think because I couldn't travel to Iceland for quite a while, I'm bringing Iceland here and we have a strong Icelandic presence on the call today. Um, and I love that. Uh, that's why I addressed my uh, fellow Icelanders in this way. Um, you may have guessed, I just said good morning. Um, and um, Andre needs no introduction in Iceland. As a matter of fact, uh, he ran for president and he was my choice for president, but we don't always get what we want. We have Melanie here, who was my choice <laughs> in office here, but see, you know, I, there are, you have to surrender, but you have to keep, keep at it, right? Um, I wanted Melanie in Congress, but, um, and she may still get there, but we're here and we're activists, we're cultural activists. He, Andre is um, a celebrated author of, uh, he meets actually all ages in his writing. I read his children's books for my children and um, he has most recently written this book here on time and water. So I have a feeling we'll be talking about time, life, and water. And um, he wrote the eulogy uh, marking the disappearance of Iceland's first glacier to melt. So as the water's uh, sea level is right, rising and glaciers are melting, I think we'll come up with something to talk about today here. So for, you, so for your environment now, Andre is uh, one of our guests and uh, uh, actually, a very timely guest, which I'm so glad that you brought on board. Hi, Andre. How are you? Hi, I'm fine. How are you? Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much. What time? You're in Iceland now. What time is it there? It's 2 p.m. here now. 2 p.m. Nice. Thank you so much for joining us uh, across, across the waters. And uh, water is really one of the key subjects that we're going to talk about in the environment now. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about you and uh, how you got to do what you're doing and what, why this is important to us? Well, uh, I'm, a, I'm a writer, so I've been writing for, uh, how old am I, uh, for 25 years. Uh, yeah, it's true. This, this year actually marks my 25th anniversary of, uh, of being published. Or I, I published wow. my first uh, poetry book when I was uh, 23 mm. and uh, and uh, and the name of that book was letter uh, name of that book was a letter to the future is that true no that that book was my first book of poetry and uh, and oh. my second book of poetry was this one here it's uh, it's bonus poetry uh -huh. uh, so so if you have been to Iceland then uh, you might Recognize Bonus as one of the most beautiful places in Iceland. It's Iceland's biggest supermarket chain. So uh, this yeah, book came out. To Iceland loved it. Loved it. Absolutely it, loved it. This book came out uh, in the year two thousand and uh, no no nineteen ninety six actually. This book here, Bonus Poetry. Beautiful. It's a mythological travel through a bonus supermarket in Iceland based on the Divine Comedy by Dante. So you start in Paradiso, the fruit division. You go to Inferno, the meat products. And then you end in the purgatory, the, the cleaning products. So some light reading, uh, some light light reading, yeah. Yeah. So this is uh, this is kind of a consumer poetry for the uh, modern day kind of uh, housewife and uh, and uh, and uh, burned out office worker uh, to buy cheap. It was sold by the counter in bonus and and sold on an eternal special offer, and you got. Hmm. One copy free if you bought thirty pounds of pork. No, <laughs> and, uh, it, it was kind of a literary prank. So, so this was one of my first books. That's great. I love that. And, and then my next book was uh, was a children's book. Uh -huh. 
It's published in America. It's called The Story of the Blue Planet. Yes. But it took, it took 12 years to be translated to English, the exotic language of English. But it was, uh, it's been published in uh, 30 languages, that book, at least, maybe 35. And then I did a sci-fi novel that is called Love Star, which uh, that, that one won next, is also in English, and it, it won the Philip K. Dick Award in the States. So, uh, so it's, it's recognized as real sci-fi. And, uh, and, and then I had kind of this career of betraying my audience, because the poetry book did very well. And when people wanted more poetry, I did a children's book. And uh, that book actually did fine. And when people wanted a new children's book, I, um, I did sci-fi that kids can't understand. <laughs> and, and then when the people wanted more sci-fi, I did a Dreamland, a self-help manual for a frightened nation. Hmm. And that is kind of non-fiction political where I'm kind of addressing uh, the environmental issues in Iceland at that time, from maybe 2000 to 2006. The book came out 2006. So, so at that time, almost every river in Iceland was at stake. That is, uh, it was because China was growing, China was gobbling up all, all raw material on the global market. And, uh, and therefore this infinite demand of aluminum came out suddenly. So suddenly the energy producers in Iceland, energy companies, they could promise almost to anyone to dam almost any river to make aluminum for almost an infinite demand. And, and this was a very dystopian era where kind of we lost our innocence, you could say. It was almost a kind of Trump-like period in Iceland where we were very polarized, where you know we it was not black lives matter or uh, vaccines or guns or something but but we were very polarized around uh, around this issue it, it kind of split families and uh, and was very political and and so i kind of jumped into that hot topic and people that maybe liked my children's book told me you know uh, i I liked your children's book, but I don't like you anymore. <laughs> so, the, so child like, has become, the child became an adult, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, so, so, so that's where I kind of got my... Uh, in that book, I was trying to understand the issue, actually, because it was... I didn't know anything about megawatts or terawatts or aluminum or, or anything about that. And, but I was so... I was may, maybe like a concerned citizen. And, and I found that I had some kind of a talent of explaining boring issues, boring, complex political issues to people, possibly even in, even in an entertaining way, in a book that they actually wanted to read a book about terawatts mm. uh, and uh, aluminum industry and stuff like that. So I, I found that I could, I could both talk about it openly or in, in public and also mm. to... Uh, explain it to people that maybe mm -hmm. never gave themselves the five minutes to to understand what was at stake so uh, so that's how i kind of came into nature conservation and things like that and then that gave me the opportunity to talk to lots of people so uh, lots of activists that came to iceland came to me and uh, so i got the opportunity to uh, talk on also in, on stages in Europe. And there I met one of the most prominent climate scientists in the world. Uh, he's working in Potsdam. And he asked me, why don't you write about the climate if you, ha if you have a talent to talk to children and sci-fi and that, and then you have the talent of, of explaining, you know, complex, boring issues. Why don't you write about the climate? And I said, I don't feel like I have the authority to write about the climate because Sometimes you're afraid to step into another person's field. I don't feel I have the authority to speak what you have the PhD in. But he said, you know, do you have authority to talk about human rights? And I said, yes, of course, you know, but you're not a human rights specialist. Uh, and, and we would probably never have democracy if people would not dare to talk about democracy unless they had a PhD in democracy. So I said, and if you don't dare to talk about this issue, 
because you're afraid of making a fool of yourself or, uh, or you feel that they are too complex, then that is part of the problem that people think the issue is too complex, too boring, too big. So I started to take notice of this and he said, you can, so I could write about a dam and I could write about a river because I could understand that and I could write about aluminum, but how many parts per million in the atmosphere? Uh, and then I went through the, the, the IPCC reports and, and so even, even really with a really good intention, it, it was it was almost like they were trying to uh, to uh, they were trying to code or they were trying to uh, yeah. encrypt. Wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, uh, well, we call it obfuscate, but uh, it really is uh, clouding the issues with uh, data. Yeah. So it was like. Uh, so what is. Uh, what is this, uh, these scenarios? What is RCP 8.5? What, what is RCP 4? What is, you know, so it was just like, just loads and loads of, of, uh, of information and I, I, and I felt very insecure, but, but with time, I started to understand it and started to get some kind of a grip of it. And uh, also I started to understand and, and just to put it in some kind of tangible context. So, so what are 100 million tons of CO2? You know, you know I could say 1 billion tons here and, and most people would just say, yeah. Or I could say 100 million or, or 100 trillion. It's just all these numbers, they just, they just become some kind of white noise for us. They, and so the idea for, of the book is how do you speak about but when it comes down to it, it, it is the biggest issue in the world. It is about everything at stake. So the idea is, how do you write about something that is bigger than language? That is, how do you, because I can't say the, no, the issue is enormous to the 12th degree. It's, it's, I can't say it's, uh, and, and even if I would scream at you now, or if I would start crying, you would just think I was crazy. But, but if I was acting according to the data, I should be screaming and crying. Mm -hmm. So we have normalized kind of this kind of, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sensible human being, I'm here, I'm, I'm proper, so I'm not gonna scream, I'm not gonna yell, I'm not gonna run. But, but what is at stake is so large. So, so the idea is that, that uh, like a black hole in space, you can't really see a black hole, the only way of, of understanding a black hole is by looking around it. So I can't explain this to you by saying one trillion because, because the, the numbers just go into, into white noise, they just collapse. So one of the ways of talking about climate change is by not talking about climate change. That is uh, by going around the periphery. And, uh, and one of the ways not just talking about science is by taking in context everything that makes us a whole human being. So, so I'm very rational, but I could be a scientist and I would look at my horoscope and I would say, oh, I'm gonna have a horrible day. So, so we can be a, a top scientist, but still a black cat will, will ruin my day. So, so we're both rational, but at the same time, we're spiritual or superstitious or religious. And, uh, and we can process data, but we're also poetic. We also see beauty. And we have a we have a future, but the future is untangible. I, I if I if I write about a child in the year two thousand one hundred, it has no meaning because it's unloaded with meaning, it, and it will always be a theoretical child or something. So the idea, instead of talking about the future, I talk about the past, kind of the same past as the future. That is, instead of talking about two thousand one hundred, I talk about nineteen forty. Or, or 1920 or 30. So, so, uh, so I use my grandparents as kind of uh, measurements of time because, they're, because they have lived the full 100 years of, of life. Uh, I was so lucky to have uh, very old people around me. So, so I can ask them firsthand, uh, uh, what, are 100 years a long time or a short time? 
and they will tell me 100 years are a short time. While at the same time, if we look at 2100, it's almost unimaginably long into the future. But when you look back, it's, it's very short. So I, I'm kind of writing about climate change, sometimes without writing about it, but I'm always using these family stories where they actually touch kind of the Anthropocene because my grandparents, they were glacial explorers. They went on a glacial honeymoon in 1956. And they were mapping and measuring the glaciers. And uh, at that time, the glaciers were in the context of eternity, that they always had been there and they believed they would always be there. But now the glaciers have been mapped and measured for uh, 60 years and, or 70 years. And, uh, and now, we know that uh, the glaciers will vanish within the time somebody is born today, becoming as old as my grandmother is now. So this is nature leaving geological speed, entering human speed. That is, and it's a fundamental change of speed of nature and speed of change. So humans have lived through cities that grow, civilizations that grow and collapse within their lifetime, but they should not live through a glacier vanishing during their lifetime. That, that's a totally different context. So the idea is that in order to scale up the language without screaming, uh, this is very big, this is very fast. I have to go to mythology because mythology, in mythology, the world is created in seven days. And actually the creation of the world in seven days against the glacier vanishing in a hundred years uh, the oceans are going to change in the next 100 years more than they have done in the last 50 million years. So actually going to creation stories where the speed of change is, is, is very fast, seven days is closer to 100 years than 100 years are to 50 million years. So, so the idea is that we are living fundamental mythological times. We're, we're living, you know, chapter changes in history books, not even history books, in geology books, we're living on a, on a chapter change, right. which is the time of mythology. Right, right. There's I, I'm here. Uh, no, 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 I, I want to <clears throat> ask you, and I'm sure we've got lots of uh, uh, questions or lots of statements coming through, specifically in terms of the uh, change of uh, uh, the transition and the hyperspeed of uh, transition uh, as we see it. But these shifts, uh, so you bring the past into the present to go ahead and provide some uh, contrast between what was, what is, and then draw a, a perspective in terms of what will be uh, so that people can have a sense in terms of how important this is, how important this issue is. I'm just wondering how, how you go about doing it because that, the storytelling is is very empowering. It's it's really the, the 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 truth underneath the mythology that really helps us to understand things. I think much more clearly or really get it. Um, how do you wind up? You know, how do you wind up conveying the the story so that people can kind of realize that this you know, <laughs> let's get up and let's go out in the streets and let's do something now. And, and what are the challenges around that? Because this is a very challenging subject and uh, it's also inc incredibly important. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are. So, so one of the ideas just to explain to people that it is bigger than language. So much of the book is about language and perception. So, so I have to kind of go lots of long loops before I go to the, to the point. So I have to explain that once it's not natural to say democracy or, or vote or, or human rights. It's, it's, not like, it's not like humans were born with that longing for that. It, that's a concept that came in with the French Revolution. So I, I tell this story about a person that came to Iceland in 1809 and gave Iceland his freedom because he was so inspired by the French Revolution and we were under the Danish rule. The problem is that the French Revolution had hardly been translated to Icelandic, the, the fundamental writings of it. So the concepts that he was bringing in, that we would not have a king, we would have a democracy and a parliament, people just like, it was just gobbledygook, you know, it was just, what are you saying and how does this work? And 
and it needed like decades and decades of declarations and literature and writings until the 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 idea was installed and we could want this and 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 act for it so i'm comparing that to the word ocean acidification that came in in the year 2006 it was mentioned once in the media it was mentioned once 2007 never 2008 twice 2009 in the whole media of iceland so so how can it be that the biggest fundamental change of the chemistry of the planet is mentioned so seldomly and and so i have to explain to people this is huge but you don't know it's huge and i can't take for granted that by just using the word that you will understand that it is huge you have to think that it you have to when you take in the word you have to understand that you don't understand it and it has the same meaning as the word holocaust in 1930 versus 1960 it's it's unloaded still it's still almost like a theoretical thing that has happened right so i am also challenged with the idea of time that is how can you make the year 2100 matter to you how do you make that year close without that being hunger games or uh, or uh, dead man walking or you know because hollywood has taken the future into apocalyptic uh, and uh, and it's all kind of up there in the entertainment industry but how can i make an intimate future which is i call it pancake sci-fi uh, where where i just i just decide it doesn't matter what gadget we have in the year 2100 you know if the phone is like this if if the you know what headset you have you know it, it doesn't really matter in 2100 uh, our fundamental goal is to be human and is to have nature and and to have relations with family and friends so in the pancake sci-fi i calculate uh, i just guess that we just want to go to your grandmother and have pancakes that's kind of the ultimate goal of of where we want to be in the year 2100 mm -hmm. so i'm playing with this generational idea because i'm i have a grandmother uh, she's 96 I have a daughter that carries her name that is uh, 12 years old and I ask my daughter when are you 96 you know if you buy this house eventually you might be sitting in this kitchen here baking pancakes what year is that when are you baking pancake pancakes mm. in the year uh, when you become 96 mm. and she does the calculation and she finds out okay I would be I might be baking pancakes in this living room in this in this kitchen in the year 2104 mm. it's like wow i might be here in this house in the year 2104 and i say yes you might be baking pancakes for somebody that carries your name it might be your favorite 12 year old mm. uh, <clears throat> you, you won't say it but it might be your favorite 12 year old in your in your in your group of grandchildren and when is that person still talking about you mm. if she or he becomes 96 and she does the calculation and she comes up with the number 2187 so i tell my daughter you know somebody that is born 1924 and you might know somebody that is still out there talking about you in the year 2187 so so the time that you can touch with your bare hands is the time of people that you know and love the time that created you versus the time of the people you will know and love the time that you will create so that's basically in her case more than 250 years that my daughter might be able to touch with her bare hands so and I'm, and and this is still human centered in the age of the anthropocene the touching each other through time is still very much in in so you're embodying time in our bodies right human yes, bodies it's, it's, it's very human centered it's it's not about uh it, it's I'm, I'm well i'm i have chapters about crocodiles that we should care about crocodiles and uh, and uh, and other people not just family but but i'm basically just bringing it instead of talking about polar bears and and theoretical places that will go underwater i'm just taking it to the core because what is at stake if is is everything that we know and love and and everyone that we know and love so 
So the idea is that I can't scale up the language by saying it's enormous to the 12th degree. But if I take everything that is most loaded in my life or in our lives and kind of place it against the data, then I have maybe scaled up something. Maybe not to the full extent of scaling up, but, but, but through poetic angle, through scientific angle, through stories, history, linguistics, and trying to kind of go all around this black hole, which the issue is. So you eventually can sense how big it actually is. I love this. I really love this a lot. It's, a, it's sort of the quantum space time continuum to people, places, and things. And this idea that we're all impacting each other, we're all very relevant. And, you know, it's, it's a, in terms of quantum theory, it really is about what impacts me, impacts you, what I do impacts someone else, it impacts the people, places, and things. It's beautiful. And we've got uh, wonderful comments here, like a simple way to make this timeline and scale fathomable by our myopic brains and perspectives. That's from Steve Finkelstein. And then, yes. you know, scaling up to care. I love that. I, I, I have a thought here in terms of a letter to the future, a comment and a question, actually, before we move on towards the more interactive part. In letter to the future, you write, there was a, 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 a funeral, a memorial, right, for our first yes. glacier to melt. And you wrote, Oak is the first Icelandic glacier to lose its status as a glacier. In the next 200 years, all will follow the same path. In the end, you say, um, this monument is to acknowledge that we know what is happening and what needs to be done. Only you will know if we did it. And my question would be, did what? Well, uh, we did what needs to be done. <laughs> <laughs> Like and what, what, what do we need to do? We need well, to care. <laughs> we need to care. We need to act. And so I often talk to college students and uh, I, I talk to uh, from 10 to university students. I, there's almost, there's a very broad range of people that I talk to. And very often you can tell the same stories to any age actually. It doesn't really matter how old people are or where they come from. So, so what scientists have told us is that we have to stop all CO2 emissions in the next 30 years. And that is a task that is, that is so huge that it, that it, it is basically the biggest single task that the human race has maybe collectively faced. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a huge, huge task because if we don't manage that, we might lose our oceans, we will lose lots of coastline, we will lose areas into desertification. We will lose so much if we don't manage this. So when I talk to young students and when I, I had the opening uh, keynote for uh, the biggest science teacher convention in the world in, uh, in Bologna or one of the bigger, bigger ones in, uh, in Europe. And I told the teachers, if a, if a, if a student that is that they are teaching in a totally different context than when why I was in high school. Because when I was in high school, it was about success, getting a good seat in the middle class uh, world or, or, or trying to succeed, all that. But there was maybe no higher meaning. Maybe most of the higher things had been done. Even, even the infrastructure had been created, you know. We never f felt this enthusiasm of building a bridge because there had no bridge been over this island. You know, bridges were just a boring thing. Uh, so we didn't feel the 1920s enthusiasm of, of a railway or a bridge or a telephone line or something. So we kind of, you could say that there was some kind of uh, no higher meaning and that went sometimes into cynicism. And, and, uh, but, but you could say to a whole group of, of young people now, it doesn't matter what you decide to learn, you know, you can go into fashion, food, energy, service. It just does not matter what you decide to learn. Everywhere you go, you will have to be a revolutionary kind of uh, part of a revolutionary change. And it's, not, and it's not negative to go into fields of any industry and having to change it. It's actually much better than 
than living in a world where you don't have to change things and everything is is confirmed and idle and and maybe uncreated so it doesn't have to be a negative task to uh, to try to meet something that it seems impossible so when a student asks why am i studying algebra then the answer is because in the next 30 years we have no in the next 50 years we have to draw down 1,000 gigatons of CO2 and nobody knows the hell how to do it. So that's why you have to study algebra. But why are we studying ethics and poetry? Well, that's because somebody that learned too much algebra might come up with a solution that is not ethical. And you will probably have to challenge that a few times in the next 50 years. So, so telling them that basically that the next 30 years will be totally different from the last 30 years and, and that the motivation to study, to, to learn, and to, to study into these problems, men decided to go to the moon not after they went, knew how to get to the moon. They had to decide to get to the moon before they knew how to get there. So, so actually, not knowing how to get there is not a negative thing either. That's just part of the big dilemma and the problem. And of course, we could fail, but we have not failed yet, at least. And, 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 and there's no reason to decide that we are going to fail. I, so I really like that. I like that, um, I like that energy you're giving to the unknown. Yeah, thank you. It's, and, and, uh, that's actually the drive I found because I found it difficult to finish this book <laughs> without finding some kind of a, a frame of hope for myself because I, I didn't feel like being a party pooper just coming in. Hey, sorry, kids, we're all dead. Uh, yeah. Goodbye. <laughs> yeah. Know, why should, and, I, why uh, should I do that? You know? Yeah, and you're basically uh, proposing a systems change, and that's part of the social, environmental justice movement worldwide now, I think, are hand in hand insisting on a systems change. It's expressed in different ways, but all these different, uh, if you want, revolutions or evolutions are coming together in demanding a systems change. And the systems change really means less CO2 emissions in any which way, because we're moving towards renewable, sustainable relationships with each other and Earth. Absolutely. It's a, a holistic view. And I think Kevin has a thought. There are so many great thinkers and philosophers and political activists and cultural activists on the call. So I'd like to encourage you to join the conversation. That's the well, nice thing about Zoom. Um, yeah, I was just, I, I, first of all, I thought your talk was fantastic, and I'm looking yeah. forward to when the book is released in uh, America. Um, and, you know, a lot of, like, the story about time and so much about storytelling is about constructing a way to interpret reality. And I was just wondering how you think about, you, you mentioned Iceland going through a similar period of political polarization a few years ago, and America is somewhat apocalyptic at the moment. How do you think about the use of storytelling to create kind of competing realities and how we can break through that to be more collaborative? Yeah, I believe in the storytelling in general and, and the Polarization is a strange thing because, because uh, often it's just like some 1% that really polarizes you. you know, so like, well, of course, I would not say racism would be a small 1%, but, 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 but this or, uh, or, or other kind of fundamental issues. But, but normally, like uh, in, a, in a society, you know, or I, and I found this on Facebook, especially when, when, uh, when some, some relative of mine is so, that goes from being the sweet grandfather be, becoming this terrible, terrible person. While, while all my life we've lived together in a good community and, and the most helpful person and all that. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm often wondering, how do you bring people together again? Uh, it is, of course, by focusing on the stories that connect you uh, and, and tie you together, maybe more than the stories that divide you. Uh, but of course, 
issues like this that you, America is going through now have to sometimes be challenged yeah, through real struggles <laughs> and through, through real force where the new paradigm is breaking into a new place. So probably this idea that everything happens in some kind of a jolly good way of, of things moving forward painlessly into the right direction might be not realistic. Maybe you are going through a, a, need, a needed painful process, but, but at the same time, probably there's, there's healing that has to take place where you try to understand where some of this hatred comes from and where some of this polarization, how do you divide people that are 99% the same? And, and how does somebody actually maybe use manipulation to do that intentionally against the society and how do you work against it? Because we had the same thing. I was almost, I was in this situation because of writing my book, uh, Self Help Manual. I could have been beating up in a bar in the northern part of Iceland for views of people that I would normally be friends with. But they would be ready to beat me up for, for being against some development that was happening in their neighborhood. So, uh, so it's a, uh, it's it's there's no simple solution to it but but it's so mainly in, in my book i'm trying to maybe focus on uh, what we share the collective kind of uh, threat the, the collective challenge that we have that we have to focus on exactly i think there's another question or a couple of other points here um, you know, I think this um, uh, altered uh, sense of reality or putting forth to, uh, 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 they call it propaganda, uh, but putting forth an alternative opinion uh, uh, really is uh, really troubling for a lot of folks to get through what the truth is. Um, there was a question around you reading uh, something from your book, and uh, I'm wondering if uh, you might uh, uh, be able to go ahead and uh, provide us with some uh, input on that. Uh, yes, and before we do that, I see Steve has his hand up. Uh, we as we don't always have access to Andre in person, but we have access to the book if you want on Amazon.com. So perhaps we want to uh, save the reading till the end, as okay. I'm sure we have more um, Steve, questions. Have a question? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm really curious, Andre, how you, um, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to ask this. Um, you know, you're saying you can pull people together by finding stories that we have in common. That's, that's what cultures have done for millions of years. You tell the stories over and over again that we all share and have in common, and it creates a bond and creates a, a culture and a society and family and a community. And now you're saying, you know, people are being very successful at finding those stories that divide us, even though it might be a small percentage. It's, and, um, you know, you're talking about time frame and, and someone uh, was, was texting and uh, chatting in there about human evolution. I wonder, it seems like humans are sort of hardwired through evolution to just get attracted um, to, to, you know, the us and them perspective uh, like it's like candy, like people just glom onto that. And it's, so, it's not, you know, it's sort of like health food, getting people to say, oh, let's cooperate. And not everybody wants to swallow that so quickly. Um, I'm, I'm curious how you see mythology and storytelling um, for use as a tool of activism right now to try to get people to drop that tribalism and, and swallow that more communal way of seeing things like it's candy. I, I mean, it's, it's so critical. It's got to happen quickly. And I'm just curious how you as a, as a storyteller and an activist might, might approach that. So, so actually, like in my book, Dreamland, it, you know, of course, uh, and, and it, it was more necessary in, in my book, Dreamland, and in this book, to, uh, to, uh, to, because, because in, in Dreamland, that, that was, that is, climate change in Iceland is not like climate change in America. That is, uh, that is uh, 
it's it's not as the the group of deniers is not as big and it's not split into political parties as much as here. But in my book Dreamland, I had to write about dams, and and the energies. <clears throat> so both in Dreamland and the, and in this book here, I uh, I tried to avoid kind of the the political discourse. That is, I tried to avoid labeling people into. I, I, I try to avoid the us and them in general in my book. So, so I'm not writing the book about us against them. So, so, so that's not kind of, so, I, and I avoid all the language that politicians and, and media has created for us. Because often when you're arguing, you could almost have two bots arguing because, because you will know what answer not not only the words that will be used, you will know the whole paragraph that will be used, and then you could have a bot that would answer with another paragraph, because <laughs> because it's almost like it, it's just on cruise control the language. So I'm very deliberately avoiding language that has been used too much, and also avoiding naming people or calling out people. Uh, directly, even though I'm very angry at them, and uh, and my wife taught me to do this also. She's a nurse, so she has to uh, work with people on from every everywhere and uh, and 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 approach people in a very kind of uh, humble way. And uh, so so I, I always when I got angry and I called out somebody, all oh, these stupid blah blah, you know, that want to blah blah, she would say, you know, don't do that. So she would help me in the reading process, but uh, but so so I would try to just not go also directly to the issue. I just tell stories. I'm just telling stories about my grandparents on the glacier, uh, and I'm telling stories when my grandmother wanted to fly, and and then slowly I can go into a story of of how the people that were traveling with my grandparents on the glacier have calculated how the glacier is melting and. So, it, so it's not like, and, and so anybody that reads that, you know, is not confronted. It's just, it's just how it is. And, and it's, not, it's not from the standpoint of, is the earth warming or not? No, it's just, this is just how it is in the story. And, mm -hmm. and, and in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the issue of dams in Iceland, uh, the problem was creativity. That is, we had been locked into this, that is uh, either this or nothing mentality. Either we get a dam and an aluminum smelter, or there will be no economy. So, so actually, in that book, I could not mention the word dam or smelter until the page 200, because first I had to reinvent the language to be able to talk about the issue. And I had to create metaphors. So I had to explain that the energy companies in Iceland wanted to always to be building dams. The role was not because that's what they knew how to do. They did not want to have built a dam. They wanted to be building dams always. So I had to explain that, that we would never have finished building the dam that we needed because basically there were 300 people that wanted always to be building dams. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the problems. Right. So that's how I got lots of people calling me, especially after Dreamland, because that was so heated. And they said, I thought you were an asshole, but you changed my mind. And, and it's very rare that somebody says that their mind was changed. Because normally we fix our identity with our opinions. And to change your mind is to lose. You know, I, I, I lost in this boxing match. He, mm -hmm. he, he hit me and he changed my mind. But, but so I, I just had to kind of go very kind of... Uh, take a very different approach to people and, and actually maybe also show people respect because everybody does, even assholes, even prisoners, you know, or, or you could say criminals deserve respect. That is, if you put somebody in prison, that person deserves respect, even though he did something that you hate and loathe and are fundamentally against. That's so, so that's kind of the, the standpoint is, is everybody deserves respect and 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 even though you're totally against what they think you uh, you can still write to them with that respect without without 
admitting to their views, if you understand what I say. So you're bridging, and I, I like how Frederica Foster has the waterfalls, our, our precious waterfalls, as her backdrop, and she has a question. I, I, I really appreciate, Andre, not uh, having the other side, but rather having a conversation with respect, trying to bridge uh, over to the bridge both sides. I think it's the only way. Frederica, you're unmuted. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. I want to know how you keep hope. I have been working on dams here. We have four dams at Dolores Snake River that have completely destroyed the Chinook salmon in, America, in the Pacific Northwest. Even the government wants to remove these dams. They, and the uber argument, they are costing too much and we don't need them anymore. We have alternative energy in the same place creating two and a half times as much energy as those dams. And we can't get rid of the dams. The people who want them have so much political power. It's unbelievable to me. So anyway, I keep thinking, oh yeah, people will see, people will see. And I just went for an easy hike on Mount Rainier. I hadn't been on this for 10 years and I was photographing the Nisqually Glacier. My heart is breaking. Yeah. How do you deal with your grief and keep hope in the face of our utter stupidity? Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry to hear that. Damn issue. Uh, I, I, I think I burned out at some point uh, after the, uh, especially after the dreamland, uh, being angry for, you know, I think my, my body thought I was in a civil war. You know, so I was constantly in this fight and flight mode for, for many years because always something precious was going to be destroyed. And I was also losing patience against this uh, showing people respect. I just wanted to do some, uh, some direct uh, acts of monkey wrench gang, <laughs> some more direct action. I was, I was, I was, I was very much there. And, uh, and I think this actually harmed lots of the people in our vicinity of the environmental group. I think some people actually died uh, just because or I, I, of course I can't prove it, but I think the stress, the grief, the anger, basically just harmed their, uh, their uh, physical health. And, and there are theories that uh, cancer can come from, from, uh, can come from uh, trauma and, and things like that. So, so I probably burned out for a few years when I should have been writing this book, I, I didn't, I didn't find any, I, I was like, oh my God, I was, I was freaking out over a dam in the highlands and I'm, am, I, am I going to write about the whole world at stake? You know, you know what, what am I, am I throwing my, my, my well-being into some open pit? You know, what, 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 what am I doing? So I just found some, I don't have a theory or anything, I just found a way to just calm down. <laughs> Uh, without being without being emotionally and and also when some people ask me I, I think also just personally I tend to be hopeful just 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 that's how I am installed so when people ask me uh, do you have hope and I say yeah I have hope but that doesn't mean that there is hope. <laughs> it's yeah, it, isn't that the Icelandic Tatarettast? Yeah. Tatarettast, <laughs> mother. I, I think that's a good segue into Axel, who is a minister. I think we can uh, uh, bring Axel to the conversation from Iceland in English to Andre. Let's do that. <laughs> For a few seconds, thank you, Andre. Once again, uh, what has popped up in my mind that I can share with you and Andre, and that's the difference between storytelling and putting forward an argument. 
uh, by putting forward an argument, you seem to be talking, uh, let's say, on your top level of your head. But when you start to tell stories, you tend to go so deep, so deep that you can uh, reach thousands of years of humanity. And I went for this book in myself, which is uh, Snorretta. And that's one of his chapters in this book about the, the primal cow, <laughs> isn't it so? Yeah. And that's a story. And that goes into you. And that's the first thing. It has to do with the collective. And if I tell you a story, it goes into your heart. But if I put forward an argument, we start to argue, don't we? Yeah. And one thing about the grief that uh, Frederica Foster was talking about, uh, there is nothing, I think, that can... Uh, how can you say it? Take care of your grief. That's my point. Unless you take the earth as your boss. Uh, my wife lost her health, similar to Andri, probably, or burned out. And I have also examples of people dying because of environmental campaign issues. And it has all, it's all the same. Uh, this work drain down people. And the only thing that can keep them alive are stories. That's my opinion. Because stories are feeding your heart. And Andre's book is full of stories, really. And when you are in a story, you enter the story. You live the story and you became the story. And that's the beautiful word saga in Iceland. You can translate it as cutting to, through something. That's one of the aspects. But mainly what I would like to contribute to is that uh, storytelling is life-giving while arguments are probably killing you. And uh, those guys or powers that want to destroy and colonize areas they are always in the argument business. They are never telling stories. They are always talking to you on some level that is not, in a way, your heart. But it's killing your heart. Something like that. Mm -hmm. But I like the boss, the earth. I am in the God business. Uh, and uh, it's also helpful to think of God as, a, as Earth. That's beautiful. Uh, as something that you have to be connected to, otherwise you are, well, flowing somewhere. And takkar, Andri. Við þurfum að heyra samt út af kvamsvirkjum. Kvamsvirkjum. I have, I see Melanie is here. We have a politician after a priest. This is very good. <laughs> We have a minister and now a politician speaking. Thank you. Thank you, Hilder. Um, thank you, Andre. I'm super motivated after hearing you speak. Uh, you. I just wanted to make a comment quickly. Uh, you know, what you said earlier about it doesn't matter what our children do because they have to be revolutionaries. I think this is like, that's where you find the hope. That's where we find the ability to continue. Um, and my good friend Paul just dropped in the comments, don't mourn, organize. Uh, I think it's really important. We all know that there is a disconnect between education and misinformation. And there's unfortunately a lot of that going on here in America. Uh, and we know if we're going to impact climate change at all, it needs to be a global response. But I just wanted to underscore the fact that here in America, uh, you know, often times as a single person, it feels like hopeless. It feels like we can't do a lot. Uh, but that's what I think they want you to think. So I just wanted to make that comment that each one of us has so much power mm -hmm. and collectively we have even more. And that's how we change things. That's how we uh, 
uh, really will move the needle. Uh, if we look at our politicians, they will tell you what you want to hear almost always. They will tell you they're fighting for the environment just as quickly as they're taking money from the fossil fuel industry. So it's important for us to understand what's going on, perhaps more important to get involved. Uh, you know, we have the probably the most important election in our lifetimes coming up in November. If you're not involved, please get involved. Even down ballot races, uh, Senator uh, Ed Markey, who's an author of the Green New Deal, is running for re-election. He has a primary challenger. Uh, he can use some help. If anyone wants to get involved in any way, um, I'm happy to serve as a resource and connect you to some of these campaigns because this is how, unfortunately, here in America, we have to change. And there's an unequal balance here. We have politicians speaking for all of us, and oftentimes they're not representing our values. Uh, so I would encourage anyone to get involved and also run for office. And I just want to thank you so much for re-energizing me because I know I feel burnt out sometimes, and you just poured a whole lot of motivation on me. So I'm, I'm excited. I just want to say thank you thank to Kate Hilton and to you, Andre, for being here. And thank you, Melanie. Can you share with us in the chat how to contact you and where to find this information on how to organize locally here? Absolutely, absolutely. Be great. And um, I will uh, save the chat and we'll be posting this on YouTube. We have several friends who are back at work. So things are, as uh, humans, we're adapting to changing times. And there is really an opportunity to wonder today what we can change as individuals. And it's really simple, it's behavioral change. It's a systems change that starts with each one of us. So I, I celebrate the fact that the coronavirus put a stop to consumption and it's really highlighted a lot of things that we don't need in my house. Um, and that's really something I think we are at the time in history where um, perhaps there's an opportunity to learn from this? I think there's more than an opportunity. And I want to thank Andre for uh, really giving us a, a lift up, if you will, a hand up uh, in really seeing this. I really love this concept of time uh, and I'm going to implement this, but certainly also uh, uh, thank you, Melanie, for coming on and giving us some resources. Frederica, Fred, Frederica Foster, you're wonderful. Thank you so much for your stories. And uh, Axel, uh, thank you again for lifting us up uh, to a higher plane and our connection with the earth. Uh, Andre, uh, uh, in order for people to get a hold of you or uh, order your book, uh, can you just uh, help us with that and uh, bring, us, uh, bring us home here as we start our close? Yeah, so my book is published in the UK. You might be able to get the Kindle or, or order it via UK, but it's going to be published in March 21 in, in the US. And the name of the book again? It's On Time and Water. On, on Time and Water. On Time and Water. Beautiful. Got it. Perfect. And, and, uh, uh, and uh, thank you so much for your, uh, your insights and your storytelling and your uh, investigation of uh, the truth as it relates to uh, time and space and our future. So it's uh, very, very powerful. And it's a great honor to be on your group here. Yes, thank you. Thank you for coming on. And uh, Hildor, uh, for folks that want to uh, learn about uh, uh, what you're up to, how do they get a hold of you? And uh, how do we, might you have any insights in terms of what we might be looking at for the next show for your environment now? Uh First of all, I, I wanted to point out um, uh, Melanie Tarico. Wait, let's see, Melanie at Tarico for Congress.com is how we uh, communicate with Melanie right now. Is that right? Um, and we have uh, Rewild Long Island uh, is organizing a native plant sale. Uh, that's one way to be kind to the environment by planting something that belongs to the earth we're standing on. Uh, that's an immediate action kind of work that binds the soil and, and gives perhaps Long Island a longer lifetime as the sea level rises. Um, there's many ways to take direct action, but what really feeds my heart is getting together like this. So I really thank everyone for their time.
time is our most precious commodity. So thank you for being here and giving us your time. You can email me at hilter at uh, rewildlongisland.org or hilter at sol.center. At soul, at soul we center. We meditate to keep on going. We find our breath. And uh, thank you, Hildora. And I'm Keith Fiveson for the Center for Wellbeing in Manhasset and the Work Mindfulness Project, uh, working with Hildor on your environment now. I want to thank everyone for showing up, as Hildor said, uh, from around the world and across the country. Uh, your environment really means a lot to us, and I hope uh, we can do more of these shows uh, as we go forward. So uh, we're going to end now, but we're going to go into overtime. So if you'd like to stay on, please do for the conversation. Thank you. Thank you.